All right, greetings, brothers and sisters out there in the world at large. Um, we are studying the book of Genesis, and today we are picking up in chapter 28. I am reading from the King James Version, and if you have your Bibles, uh, feel free to turn there and uh, follow me. And uh, we are picking up, if you remember last week, if you listened to last week's um, uh, Bible study, or the last segment, however you want to look at it, in uh, Genesis um, 27, we read about a little family drama with uh, Jacob and Esau, and the mother got involved of who got the best blessing. Today we're kind of picking up where that left off in chapter eight of chapter 28 of Genesis. And uh, we see how the little family drama turned out. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. They, the daughters of Canaan and the region they lived were causing a bit of a family problem. Obviously not believers in the uh, Yahweh or Elohim, the God of Israel, the only one true God at that time, not really even known as the God of Israel because Israel kind of really, uh, really hadn't really come to fruition yet. Um, that's going to happen with uh, Jacob uh, later on. Uh, right now we're still in the time of uh, Isaac and uh, passing on the baton to Jacob and uh, Esau's involved a little bit here and uh, but we still have the one true God Yahweh um, uh, Elohim uh, the creator God um, and, and who that is uh, I believe was uh, Jesus Christ uh, and is uh, uh, before the New Testament, sometimes when Christ appeared, it was a Christophany uh, or a Theophany before uh, his physical appearance to man in the New Testament where he was born of a virgin. He came in the womb of Mary and was born. And uh, But we also see God walking in the garden. Um, in the cool of the day, in the book of Genesis says. And um, uh, I believe the Bible teaches that Jesus is the creator. And uh, the Father gave him that power and that authority because he is God. He, uh, Jesus is not a created being, he is God, he has always been. And so we see that pattern, uh, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They are, they are one, okay? I'm not going to try to explain it to you because we don't really have the concept to explain an infinite and eternal God. We can barely understand textbooks that are handed to us that uh, men have written and we try to read and study and understand them, but we really can't understand them. How much more so how we cannot really understand an infinite universe, how we, we really can't understand that. And then we can't really understand a, another dimension you know, um, or even the third dimension, three dimensions, you know, where you have the physical realm in which we see it. We have the spiritual realm where uh, principalities and powers, Satan and his angels are allowed to have some beings, some dealings with in the spiritual realm. Um, and then we have the third heaven, the third kind of realm where God the Father and the heavenly angels um, uh, inhabit. Um, and it is their domain, their their kingdom, um, and however you want to put that. So it's kind of hard to understand. Um, but now getting back to our text here, I've kind of given you a little bit of a spiel of uh, trying to understand God. Uh, uh, it, it is a, a concept that is summed up in this. Understand that God has put many things in creation and in history to let us know that he is there and you cannot escape it. And he gave his son um, to die on a cross because blood had to be shed 
to cover our sins. Even in Israel, in the Old Testament, the, the sacrifices and the keeping of the law did not wash your sins entirely clean. They were only a covering until Jesus Christ came and washed our sins away by his blood because a lamb and a goat and a bull, their blood cannot wash the sins away. They're, they're, it's too heavy. They're too evil. Okay, so only the blood of God himself shed on the cross can wash away our sins. And so hopefully I didn't lose you there. I gave you kind of a, a, a long spectrum in the spiritual and biblical world. And uh, now we're going to come back to Genesis 28. And we're going to see the pattern that God has placed on earth of dealing with men. Uh, nothing special. We're nothing special. And God's going to deal with men that are nothing special to bring forth the promise upon the earth, the promise of his dealing with mankind. And so we have Isaac and Jacob here having dealings. And, um, and so we're going to see here uh, also kind of an uh, interesting thing. Uh, probably many of you have heard the Stairway to Heaven song. Here we really have a real Stairway to Heaven um, where Jacob has this dream and uh, he sees it. And, uh, and we're, we're going to see what happens here. And uh, so there's really a situation that happened like that, and that takes place in Genesis 28 here. So with that, enough chewing the flab. Let's get moving on. <laughs> Arise, go to Padan Aram, in verse 2, to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. So... Basically, he's saying, go home to your mother's people and take a wife there. Don't, don't, don't take a wife from amongst these people here in Canaan. And God Almighty bless thee and make thee fruitful and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. And give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land, wherein thou art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram, unto Laban, son of Pethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob and Esau's mother. So we see we have some uh, Syrian ties into the bloodline of Israel. Um, we've seen that through uh uh, Abraham also, uh, and Isaac, uh, and now with uh, Jacob, um, and uh, that pattern of dealing with the people groups in the Middle East, God has chosen to work with. It doesn't mean he doesn't work with the rest of us, but that is his people group where he's really working with the most. And I, I won't go off on that tangent on a soapbox, but I will tell you this. This is a little side note. For the nation of Israel to have survived through so many horrific exploits against their peoples to destroy them. And they have survived, and they have endured, and they have become a profitable and prosperous small nation in the midst of a very hostile world. And it's incredible. Okay, So just as that little side note, let's continue on. And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padan Aram unto Laban, son of Bethuel, the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob, and Esau's mother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and sent him away to Padan Aram to take him a wife from thence, and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. And that Jacob obeyed his father and his mother and was gone to Padan Aram, and Esau, seeing that the daughters of Canaan pleased not Isaac his father. So he, he saw that his wife, or wife, he didn't please his father. Now watch what he does here. Then went Esau unto Ishmael and took unto the wives which he had 
Malon, the daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son, the sister of Naboth, to be his wife. So he took more uh, godless women uh, into his uh, coven of wives. And um, so he was a very contentious child, Esau. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. So he, you, you get the picture here. He's kind of maybe at the top of a mountain or in the valley or something. And he takes these stones and he kind of sets them up as a little pillow uh, for his little bed to sleep in. And it says, he dreamed and behold a ladder set up on the earth and the top of it reached to heaven and behold the angels of God ascending and descending on it. That is a fascinating, fascinating uh, scripture. And Probably you've seen the pictures, or maybe you haven't, but there's a lot of pictures that people have painted where you see angels going up and down a stairway or up and down a, a ladder, and the ladder would be kind of like something that you would walk, not, you know, a ladder that you crawl up and down with your hands, or maybe it was, you know, it, we don't really see more so a stairway, probably, uh, and something that um, Jacob could relate with. And uh, once again, you know, there's been songs about, you know, the stairway to heaven and all that kind of stuff. And, but it was the truth that God is working in the spiritual realm. And it's going on continually. But we don't see it. But for a brief moment here, as many of the patriarchs did, the old apostles, uh, some of us in the New Testament in this, in this era, this time of grace that we, we live in. Some of us have seen things that are really in the spiritual realm and God just gives us a brief moment to see it and then when it's gone. And just as a, I don't know, maybe like a, uh, just a little taste, like Lazarus, you know, when he was dead, he didn't, you know, didn't stay alive forever. At one time he had to die permanently and then go up into heaven. But Lazarus got to see just a little taste of, of eternity. Okay, and that Jesus hadn't hadn't uh, died and rose from the grave yet, so heaven the heavens weren't really opened up yet into the eternal realm of uh, our Father, um, but they had paradise in the in the center of the earth. You know, we read about that uh, in uh, the Gospels, where uh, uh, Lazarus went to where Abraham was, and he was comforted. And there was a time of like a paradise. And there's a place of suffering because our souls last forever. You know, you can't, God breathed into us life and you can't vaporize a soul, a spirit. You know, we are, we will be forever, okay? Once we are created, you can't just take away a spirit because you're, you are a spirit. You are what you will always be, a spirit. And so you'll either inhabit eternity with Jesus Christ in life and our Father of of paradise with him or you will spend eternal damnation and consequences in the outer darkness in the lake of fire and that puts a very serious serious bent on this life why why men and women play in sin when it jeopardizes and risks their eternal soul i do not know but it does happen we all have fallen and um but the righteous man falls seven times and he gets up seven times and um, God has shown man that we are capable of sin, but we must get up and walk and be honest and say, yep, yeah, I did that and it's time to move on. I don't want to do that again. Okay, and so at whatever your, the length of your Christian walk, whether it be one year, six months, 60 years, 50 years, um, I've been a Christian a follower, you know, for uh, 30 plus years now. I'd have to do the, the math here, and I'm not gonna. Uh, okay, and so I, uh, and I had times where I was in my uh, peaks, mountain peak tom, time of experience with Jesus Christ, and times where I was down, not really walking too very well. And He had mercy on me during that time where I was kind of blind, and and He got me up again. Okay, and and uh, 
And so I'm grateful for that, you know, that time of grace that God shed upon me. But the time comes where God expects us to get up and walk, okay? And if you fall, then, then you get up, okay? But uh, the time comes as mature Christians, you have, have to get up and walk. You know, you can't be falling into the same foolish sins that you did as a babe. You need to become, you know, as it says in 1 Corinthians, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I did as a child, but when I became a man... Then I took on manly things, and you want, need to become a mature man or woman in Christ and, and, and exercise adulthood in Christianity. And that's where God says, may you be perfect or mature in your faith, because we're, nobody's really perfect, but mature. And the, the better, best word is be mature in your understanding of eternity in Jesus Christ. Now I'm going a lot of different directions for you, and hopefully I'm giving you some new things and old things to enjoy as we're going through Genesis here, because we have just a little story about Jacob, and, but there's just a vast array of things we can touch on as we're going through Genesis. And uh, right here we're kind of touching on the eternal realm and the ladder or the stairway to heaven and how God sometimes lets us have a little peek into eternity. And sometimes when I'm walking at night and I look up into the heavens and I see a shooting star, it's like, whew, there it goes. For me, that is like a little hint or a little taste of eternity. Anyway, let's continue on here. Verse 13, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, the God of Isaac, the land wherein thou liest to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, and to the east, and to the north, and to the south. And thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. In other words, by your family, um, Jacob, all the families of the earth will have the ability to be blessed on the earth and blessed spiritually forever because of you. It's quite a blessing, but it's also quite a responsibility. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. So God said, regardless of what goes on around you, I will fulfill my promise in you. And so remember that when you're going through hard times, maybe you've fallen, maybe you've just gotten up, maybe you're in sin, maybe you, need, you know you need to get out, but you can't, and you say, well, God's done with me. He's not done with you. But understand, you got to get up. You got to get up, you got to walk. And if you've been walking, keep walking and just understand God has not finished with you. He is not finished with you until you're standing before him saying, Oh Lord, thank you that I made it and I'm here. That's when he's done with you, not before. Okay, No matter what your age is, whether you're 80 or you're 50 or 20 or you're 10, God will fulfill his plan and with you if you are willing and if you're honest to say, I love you, and I'm sorry for my sin, and I want to follow you. God will work in your life. And Jacob waked out of his sleep, and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. In other words, Bethel is, uh, you know, the transliteration would be um, the house of God, Bethel. It's kind of interesting. Like a lot of churches name their, their churches Bethel, such and such, you know, whatever their denomination is. And it's kind of a cool name. And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I shall surely give 
a tenth unto thee. So before um, the law was even given, and we're going to see that later on uh, with Moses. Uh, we're not quite there yet. We got um, several meetings together before we get to Moses. Jacob said, if you'll be with me and guide me and protect me, I will give a tenth unto you, a tenth to the ministry of the word of God, to God's people, um, to, for sacrifices, uh, which they did in those days. And, uh, and God blessed him. And from him came um, the nation of Israel. So there's a lot of things we can talk about in Genesis here. And uh, 28, uh, we talked about a few of them. Um, it is interesting that Jacob had this dream. Obviously, God spoke to him. But later on, he suffered, which is another aspect of the Christian walk. Just because you're suffering or you're enduring hardship or affliction or persecution, whatever it might be, it doesn't mean it has nothing to do with whether or not God loves you or doesn't love you. The point being is all of us must endure hardship for the sake of the kingdom of God. And battles must be won. And sometimes in the war, we lose a few battles, not because of sin. It just means it just didn't turn out. But it doesn't mean that God wasn't with you in that battle. God was setting the foundation and the footings. And sometimes a few defeats are necessary for you to have a victorious war. And so we're going to see here, I don't want to give you the whole story away, but Jacob kind of went through a lot and he kind of got ripped off a little bit. But he, in the end, he was victorious, obviously, and because we have the nation of Israel. So anyway, I think we, we chewed the flab on a lot of cool things in Genesis 28 there. Hope you enjoyed. I sure did. And uh, with that, I'm going to cut you loose here. Until next time, from the Bears Gym, God bless you folks.